uh, Brother Luke, uh, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this broadcast of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. And today we're going to continue with the subject, uh, Old Testament Pictures and Shadows of Jesus' Blood Atonement. Uh, this will be part four. And uh, we're going to pick up where we left off last time, but first let me introduce the, the panel. Uh, we, we have uh, Brother Mitchell Belenkoff. And he lives in San Diego, and uh, if you don't know about his channel, I hope you'll subscribe to him. I, I even have uh, collected probably 20 of his videos or so and put it into a playlist titled uh, uh, Mitchell Belenkoff Interesting Insights, or Brother Mitch Interesting uh, Insights. Um, Mitch has the ability to kind of see things in the scriptures sometimes that the rest of us kind of overlook and we just don't see it. So um, it's going to be very worthwhile for you to uh, subscribe to his channel. Uh, and Mitch, you want to say say hi to everybody and then I'll move on? Sure. Uh, hello. Uh, welcome from uh, <laughs> welcome to San Diego, California. <laughs> and I uh, hope everybody does well today. Yeah. yeah. I noticed you had to throw that welcome to San Diego in with your Beautiful scenery and climate there. Uh, probably everybody's jealous of you except for Scott. So we're going to go to Scott next, and he he also lives nearby you. No, um, I'm 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 envious uh, and jealous also. It's a, a, a 99 miles north of uh, of Mitch, but about 15 degrees warmer. I guarantee you, and a lot more humid up here. It seems like. All we're, right, well, we're, tech, we're technically a desert in Los Angeles, and the desert wants it back. <laughs> it's trying always to get it back. Hey, brother, while you're talking, uh, introduce yourself to the viewers and uh, uh, tell, tell them a little bit about your, your channel. Uh, well, I'm, uh, I'm, my name's Scott, and I, uh, I've had a couple of channels previously on YouTube and uh, uh, enjoyed most of it and sometimes uh, ran into conflicts and arguments, and uh, that's not what we're to be about. I think there's supposed to be unity in the body of Christ based on what's clearly stated, and it's not that confusing. It's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God in all and through all. And uh, if you can come to common agreement on that, I think you'll have uh, fellowship. And uh, you'll be edified and grow. But if you want to quibble, it doesn't say there are, uh, there's a one baptism from God and another by man and you've got to be dunked and all these other things. It's pretty, pretty straight cut and clear. Uh, what uh, we're to believe today, and it's just a simple uh, gospel, and that even uh, people argue about, but it's clearly stated also in the Bible. It says, it says I declare unto you the gospel, that uh, Christ died for our sins, was buried, and uh, God raised him the third day. So that's about all. I, <laughs> I kind of try to keep it simple and try to avoid arguments, especially on the new channel, because uh, three strikes in California, <laughs> and on YouTube you're out. So the, the first two I... I kind of uh, fled in disgust and dismay, but uh, this time uh, we're doing it different. So stop by if, uh, if you want to yeah. be um, uh, have fellowship and a good time and maybe learn something new and, and uh, exchange uh, the love of the Lord with each other. Hey, brother. I, I, I know that I not only speak for myself, but many, many other YouTubers who are very happy that you're back in action on, on YouTube. Uh, I know that you're, you're loved by a lot of people. It's because your message is just pure love, pure grace. So I'm glad you came back. Thank you. And let's go to Sister Tanya. Uh, Sister, will you introduce yourself? Hello, my name is Tanya. I'm known as Galaxy Dreams 3 on YouTube. Uh, my channel focuses on encouraging other Christians who you know, may have been uh, involved with religious abuse and uh, legalism and all that nastiness and uh, I myself was involved in that for some time and it almost ruined me and I came out uh, from it swinging and now my faith is rock solid and I like to share my story with others to help encourage and let people know that God loves them and uh, that's about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, the, the strife that you referred to, and also Scott referred to him, I know Mitch has not been immune to it. I know he's had his share of uh, people attacking him. We've, we've all, we all have our, 
I guess, for lack of a better word, enemies, the people who don't like us, don't like our message, uh, but we all stand unified in the simple message of salvation, and that is that uh, faith in Jesus as your Savior is sufficient. Nothing else is required. We, we know that the, the Bible is a love story, and uh, uh, we, we, we love our Savior, and we love the brethren. We love our fellow man. So um, I hope that anybody who's watching, that, watching this now will uh, hope you can agree with us on that. Let's love and praise Jesus Christ, our Savior, and let's love each other and encourage each other. Now, let's pick this up where we left off. We've covered a lot of ground now. This is the fourth uh, part of this uh, show or discussion. Uh, and I'm going to start off uh, the way I did on each show, just by quoting uh, something I found, because this really kind of uh, summarizes what I believe the real purpose of the Old Testament is. It says, quote, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. It is almost as if the characters of the Old Testament are acting out of play, the meaning of which they are completely unaware. It is only the audience of the play, those who watch in light of solid knowledge of the New Testament, who understand the meaning of the New Testament events in this play. To put it even more simply, the theme in the Old Testament is the Messiah is coming, bringing salvation. The theme of the New Testament is the Messiah is here, bringing salvation. So uh, with looking at the Old Testament through that lens, uh, you can see clearly things that uh, were only shadows in the past. Uh, that. Uh, People who didn't have the benefit of this uh, fulfilled uh, this um, canon that we have, all the scriptures that we, we have to refer to and learn from, we have the benefit of understanding the end of the story that the Savior came. His name is Jesus Christ. He died for our sins. He rose from the dead. Believe in him for eternal life. We know that, and as we look back at the Old Testament, we can see things now that we wouldn't have understood before without looking at it through that lens. So we've cited probably, you know, 50 or 100 examples already, but now we're moving on to discuss what's commonly called the law. <laughs> I know this is one of uh, Mitch's favorite subjects. He has some, <laughs> Mitch has some very interesting insights on the law. So go to his channel and watch those videos. You'll, you'll hear things of you, about the law that you uh, <laughs> did not ever see before. But let's start off with this. Let's look at Deuteronomy 30.16. It says, In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments, and his statutes, and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. Um, all right, I have something on mind that I want to discuss in this verse, but let's let's ask the, the panelists here to first comment uh, on what that verse means. Uh, Mitch, why don't we start with you? Can you? Can you uh, I don't know if I'm on or not. I I, I somehow lost the screen. Yeah, I, we hear you. Okay. We uh, hear you. We see you. Okay. I just can't see my it. And so uh, I kind of lost track of what you're saying. Can you can you repeat that? Okay, we're looking at Deuteronomy 30:16. Can you okay. find that? No, I don't have it on me. So you just just read it one more time and let me. Okay, see. read it again. And I'm going to kind of emphasize certain words that I think are really important related to this study. In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in His ways and to keep His commandments and His statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land where thou goest to possess it. Okay, yeah. Um, that statement uh, basically says if you follow God's law, you'll be blessed. And the thing is, is that that's, that idea has been carried through to the New Testament. 
the only problem with that, that statement that people don't realize is that part of the law had to do with sacrifices. It had to do with relying on the blood to cover you for your sins. That was part of the law. So if you follow his ways, then you must trust in, the, in, in, in God's sacrifices that he put forward for our sins in order to be blessed also because nobody is able to follow those statutes perfectly. So, um, so when he laid down that statement, a lot of Israel fo uh, followed for a while, and when they did follow, the Lamb was blessed. But what they followed was following the law and also doing the sacrifices. But when they were unfaithful and stopped following the Sabbath days and stopped following um, by faith, uh, uh, doing the sacrifices or trusting in the sacrifices and started, started going off in other tangents, they, they went off, and when they went off, they were not blessed. And so this whole theme has carried through even into the New Testament where people, uh, a lot of people uh, go to church, and they believe in the law, and that's why I have a lot to say because I'm an outlaw. But, uh, they, believe, <laughs> they believe in the law, but they don't, they don't trust in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And that theme, that, that was what was hidden when we say that, that, that the Old Testament was the New Testament concealed. When the New Testament was revealed, what was revealed was trusting in the blood of Jesus Christ. So, so I find it interesting that, that uh, uh, if they followed uh, those statutes, they were blessed, but also they had to follow the blood. But, uh, they did, but Moses had said that they weren't going to follow <laughs> and, and, uh, later on, and, and indeed they didn't follow, and they fell away. So uh, I, I think that, that that's an excellent precursor to, to really start with when it comes to the Jews and the law and comparing it to, to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, that's, that's uh, what I was looking for. And uh, Scott, let me uh, ask you to comment, but keeping uh, this, this thought in mind, is that uh, we're talking about Deuteronomy, and if, by the way, this same point that's made in this verse here, the exact same point, almost word for word, is made uh, at least two or three other times in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. it's talking to the Jews, and it's talking about if you keep these laws and commandments, you're going to be blessed, and, and you're going to get into the promised land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, it's uh, the difference between uh, God uh, coming to uh, his uh, begotten nation, through Abraham, he begot a nation that was uh, unlike uh, any of the other nations on the earth. He, he wanted to make them something unique and special. So he essentially said, hey, uh, let's make a deal. Okay, what's the deal? You know, and, uh, initially, it was uh, Abraham was justified by faith, by simple faith. But uh, as you read on in the Exodus, you find out that they, they it's, a sad, it's a sad commentary on, on, on their history. Because what they were doing is the same thing that people are doing today. They would rather uh, follow rules and regulations than have a relationship with, uh, with God. Back then, and the same thing applies now. Uh, faith is actually superior to the law, and you're not, you're not exactly free from the law. But uh, there's, a, there's a difference between obeying the law then and submitting to the law now. And there's only one law and that's the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And most people do not want to yield and submit to that, uh, to that law. It's a new life, but you have to give up. You have to surrender. You have to forget your ideas of being made uh, uh, right in his sight by your behavior and all these things. They all have to be unlearned because we're conditioned. It's uh, what uh, I they believe in Latin. It's the quid pro quo. You know, if I do this, you'll do that. But is God, uh, is God providing in the same way today as he did then? Because Jesus said, look at the lilies. They don't spin or labor, and yet they're taken care of. I've tried that approach, especially when I first moved to California, and it didn't work. It was like, uh, hey, I need money to pay my bills. You know, If you don't work, you don't eat. That's what we're told in the New Testament. So there are these differences. And uh, the laws are, are gone. The written code has been nailed uh, uh, to the cross, but uh, all in the hope that uh, it will not uh, uh, dim the light that uh, is that Christ wants to shine upon you and uh, and have a clear you know union with you, but that law gets in the way because most people won't yield to the law of the spirit of life in Christ. They want the old law, 
just tell me what to do, okay, and I'll do it. Yeah, that's not a relationship. It's a contract, and it's uh, unrewarding at best. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you to uh, expound on a particular word you used because I, I'm afraid that there's a lot of confusion. I, I, I know exactly what you mean when you said we need to surrender. Uh, whereas a lot of people in the Lordship Salvation Camp, uh, they, they will use that same word, but they're, they're applying it differently. And they mean that you've got to pick up your cross and follow him. You've got to follow his commandments and so on. So yeah, it's, it's, it's the difference. Yeah, it's the difference between having confidence in a self-improvement course, and yeah, I can do this, and we should all do this. Let's all obey the law. If we really love him, we'll, we'll obey the law. As opposed to what Peter said, that uh, we've been handed an empty uh, life by our forefathers, uh, a futile estate, I believe is what one of the translations says. And when you see that, and you go, "Wow, you know, like I'm I'm hopeless to do anything. Certainly hopeless to be perfect without." without grace. So I have to surrender to his way of doing it and not my way of doing it. Uh, so I, I've used the word um, in many of my videos, the term hopeless and helpless. Uh, I, I believe a person needs to come to the conclusion that they are in a hopeless state, that, that they, there's nothing that they can do on their own power to satisfy God and, and be reconciled, and, and they're helpless. Uh, it, and, and then there's only one thing that they need to call on the name of the Lord and rely on Him, and I think that's uh, what you're you're meaning when you say sur surrender. Is mean I give up. I give up trying to follow the law, trying to earn my way to heaven, trying to work my way to heaven. I surrender, Jesus. I need you to be my savior. Yeah, these things get mired in confusion, you know, and and it's it don't get you, I, many people think that true humility is uh, just Brow beating yourself up every day. I'm worthless. I'm you know, this and that. That's not real humility. Humility is just uh, believing what God said. Because you know, we're far from hopeless. You know, once once you're in Christ, you know, it's uh, otherwise it would be a, a matter of uh, you know, if he if wasn't raised from the dead, we might as well just all go out and party, and because tomorrow we die. But that's clearly not the not the case. It's that today we live because we put our trust in Him. But uh, it, it, it's, it's give up give up, and let, let go and let God, I think, is what the, uh, the 12 yeah. members kind of say. Good, and, uh, yeah, that's a good, uh, good saying. Uh, you just get tired of spinning your wheels because you get the same results, and if you keep doing it, you, you'd be declared insane. You know, it's, you, I'm, this time I'm really not going to drink, and this time I'm really not going to start smoking dope again, or whatever the case may be. And uh, ultimately, uh, Things are positive and work great as long as uh, uh, things are positive around you. But the, the minute that atmosphere changes, you're right back in the same old trouble again. So uh, the, the cure is, uh, is having Christ, the life-giving spirit, in you. Because you know? he's been made for us to be, uh, first of all, uh, there's, a, there's a list, but the list is let off. He's been made to be wisdom for us. So you start relooking at your problem, and, and, and he brings things out that are deep down that's causing the trouble that you would never have seen uh, in yourself uh, in and by yourself. Other people may see them and point them out, but you're blind to them. Yeah, this is part of our condition here <laughs> in life. I, I see this blindness in so many people who uh, attack us and say, this faith alone is, uh, is a heresy, you know, there's more is required. And, and then when I asked them, I said, well, tell me what more is required, and are you living up to this standard that you're imposing on us? Mm -hmm. they, they look at everybody else and judge everybody else whether they're doing the right things and doing enough, but they, they're blind to their own, uh, the fact that they're, they all fall short. We all fall short of this, this impossible standard of perfection. Well, the problem, the problem, I think, with men is, you know, you go all the way back to Babel, you know, it's a, let us build let us build, let us make, let us uh, do these things to make a name for ourselves. And uh, when you uh, surrender and realize uh, that the, the faith in Christ is the only way to please God, uh, you're given a new uh, identity. You know? And it's not, so, you know, you're, it's the only place you can really go. You can only go to the cross and you can truly forget about yourself. I mean, if you if you yield to that, that simple law, that uh, if one died, all died, and that we're dead to sin and alive in Christ, and it's, it's a new identity and a new start. So it doesn't really make any difference. This is why Jesus went to, uh, 
like a, a lamb, you know, to be sheared without voicing any complaint or registering any protest at all. He never spoke in his defense because God already spoke and said, this is my son who I, whom I dearly love. And Paul could say the same thing. Is that, you know, it doesn't make any difference what you think or say about me, good or bad, because it's irrelevant. It, you don't have the final say. God has the final say. But you have to uh, do the exchange with him. You have to go, okay, I'm, yeah. No mas, I put down my uh, sword, my enmity, my natural sort of, uh, as we all men have it, and we, things go wrong and we don't blame, we blame our wives or we blame God, we blame anybody but ourselves. So when you, you surrender and, uh, and realize there's got to be a better way and I'm, I'm going to believe upon the risen Savior, you're given a new identity. So the, the, the finger pointing has no place uh, amongst Christians and it's heartbreaking to see. Okay, uh, I want to, Tanya, thank you for being patient. Uh, when I start talking, uh, you can go on for hours and it's out stretch. So we did uh, a marathon the other night. <laughs> Tanya, are you still there? I am. I just woke up from my nap. It's cool. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I want to ask you, yeah. Tanya. Uh, I want to ask you two things. Uh, yeah. One is um, if there's anything you want to expound upon what's been said either by uh, Mitch or Scott, and also this. This I want to emphasize this. Uh, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. Uh, concentrate a little bit on what it means, shall bless thee in the land and, and possess it. Uh, well, to me that's saying that, you know, he's going to bless them and, and, and with that comes, you know, everything they could possibly need. Uh, I think of, you know, Garden of Eden kind of stuff. I mean, you know, like the, I'm sure that they probably will be given uh, all that they need to survive and prosper and have a good life uh, and possibly maybe even be protected from other people who are around them, uh, other groups of people who, you know, maybe don't like them. Um, so, and go and possess it. Yeah, so I guess that's what I'm getting out of that, that last part there. Uh, one thing that I want to recommend to everybody uh, is, is uh, a paper and pen because as you're listening to each other talk, thoughts are going to come to your mind and then you're going to forget it when, you're, <laughs> when you're, I call on you. So every time I get a little thought I, about someone's uh, comment, I make a little note and that way I'm going to have it because I don't know, maybe when I was younger I didn't need to do that, but it's helpful. Uh, okay, I want to move on to another verse. Um, uh, what, did you, what did you just say? No, I'm sorry. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but let me, let me make this point that uh, I, I think as we proceed, we're going to really be concluding that the, the law, following the law, uh, many times stated in the Old Testament, they're told, Follow these laws, follow these commandments, follow these ordinances, and so on, and you will be physically blessed. We pointed out that uh, they received um, the um, all the blessings uh, that we sought to talk that God gave the Jews already. You know, He gave them meat. He gave them the doves uh, from the sky for meat. He gave them manna, the bread from heaven. He gave them water in the wilderness. So they got all these physical blessings. And the final physical blessing that they're going to get by being obedient is coming into this promised land. So uh, the, the, the purpose of the Jews following those laws was not for their salvation. The, the purpose of the, them following their laws was for their uh, the, to be blessed and get into the promised land. I think that's what we're going to see as we go through with this. Uh, but now we're going to go to Galatians 3.23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the, the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there, there is neither bond nor free, 
there is neither male nor female, for all for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Brother Mitch? Well now, heirs according to the promise, when in the Old Testament we had to follow all these rules to get into the promised land. The promised land for us, of course, is the kingdom of heaven, and the promised land for them was, of course, Israel. Uh, so, but you see that there's a picture here of, of going into the promised land. Uh, but one way was by by doing all these these mitzvot and staying on what's called well mitzvot is a is a good work. It, it, it's all a, a mitzvot is like one of the laws. They have what's it 613 mitzvot that the Jews do. That's why they have these. Uh, uh, tassels on the side of their, you know, and they have to follow this thing called the derrick. Well, why I say the derrick? The derrick is the is the, is the is to stay on the path. The derrick is the path. And Jews today live their lives by following the derrick. And their status in front of other Jews is their money. And why is their money their status before the other Jews? Because if they follow the derrick, then that means they that they'll be rich. And if they're rich, okay, that means that they're righteous. So in the eyes of the Jew, the richer you are, the more respected you are, and the more righteous you are, because you've been blessed with money. Mm. Uh, so today, the, the Jews believe in, in following that path and following that derrick. Uh, and, and indeed, I believe Satan does bless them, but I don't believe that, that, that God... You know, God has rebuked the Jews over and over, uh, but to a certain degree, their end doesn't lead them into the true pl promised land because they're not trusting in the Messiah. They're, they're trusting in themselves being, being able to follow the path. And since nobody's able to follow the path, the kingdom of heaven has to come another way. And part of the path was to trust in the blood sacrifices, which they didn't understand. Because it was it was a picture of trusting in Christ, so the new way by faith to become part of Abraham's seed and to inherit the promised land, not riches on earth, but the riches in the kingdom of heaven, was trusting in Christ and Christ alone. Mm. Hallelujah! Well said, brother. I, Very well said. I uh, when when uh, Mitch uh, we had this same conversation in the past here on the phone. And talking about the Jews looking at money as as proof that they are righteous, uh, and so that's <laughs> it's very interesting. I never really understood that until he explained that to me. Wow. Uh, let me ask uh, Scott when it says uh, uh, the the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, uh, but but after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah. Uh, and if, let me just add that I was thinking of a couple things when Mitch was talking. It's amazing how that, uh, how that has carried over into our way of thinking today. I mean, as little as probably 150 years ago in the United States, prosperity was judged by how fat you were. <laughs> I mean, this is true. They looked at a guy like uh, Chester Arthur, or some of these presidents that were very rotund, and uh, they deemed them prosperous because uh, agribusiness hadn't grown to the state that it has now, and uh, this uh, guy is obviously not missing any meals, and he has everything he needs, and, uh, and it's, it, it's, it was always a visible... You know, it, and yet we say, don't judge a book by its cover, but we clearly do, and I guess it started a long, long time ago, and it stayed with us. Now, about the... Uh, about the the schoolmaster and, uh, and and being set free again, it's 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 a matter of uh, uh, obeying commandments or yielding to the law of the spirit of life in Christ. And if you look, if you if you have a problem uh, right now in church and you're adhering, you, law creeps into to denominations all the time. It's very subtle, sometimes very blatant. And uh, the the one that sort of I woke up to real quick was the tithing situation. And I could always tell, and a pastor will go unnamed, it's here in Los Angeles, so I could always tell that the, the, the plate was going to be offered about 15 minutes before it is actually before me. Because, uh, oh, the music would change, and 
little quavering in the voice, and if you if you if you really love God, you know, if you if you you have to prove it. It's like no, you, it's that's law, and you know, and uh, if you if you really have a problem with the with tithing and you don't want to. You don't like giving that 10%, uh, don't become a grace believer because you're going to wind up giving a lot more. <laughs> you're not going to really be conscious of it because uh, it'll be him giving through you. And uh, part of that is so your right hand won't be knowing what your left hand is doing. And you do it and you move on and forget. And, and, and conversely, you, you mess up and uh, you move on and forget because you, you truly have uh, taken yourself out of the arena of being judged by law but being uh, under grace. Yeah, so that's that's kind of a, it's a superior way of life, unquestionably, mm -hmm. to trying to obey uh, the laws. It's just, nobody does. <laughs> and, and if you try, you're obligated to obey all of them. So, Well, I, uh, a lot of people look at the Ten Commandments as the law, but as Mitch mentioned, uh, there's Ten Commandments on the tablets of stone but there were 613 total laws that the Jews were issued uh, through Moses. Uh, and, um, and then, of course, uh, we as Gentiles and Christians, you know, a lot of people think that we're supposed to be under that system and follow all those laws. Uh, but, and yet, the law, according to what Paul says here, uh, the only value of that law is to, to show us, uh, our, be a schoolmaster to teach us our uh, inability, our, our hopeless, helpless condition, and therefore we will cry out to Jesus to save us. And I've used the same, uh, made the same point on when people want to go into a lot of Jesus' sayings, pick up your cross and carry me, uh, sell everything you own and give it to the poor and come and follow me, cut off your hand if it causes you to sin, and so on and so on. And he said, and he, and he even said, go and be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Mm -hmm. Now. Uh, you know, these are all like commands of Jesus, and people want to take all these things and make these as these are the things that are required if you're going to get salvation. And yet, but really, all of these things fall under the same heading of schoolmaster. It teaches us it's impossible. And why, why, why do they do that? Let me ask you. Why, why do they do that? I think they do it because that's what they've been taught their whole lives. All religions are based upon the merit system. Or they, or they just really don't believe in Christ and His or, sufficiency. And yeah, you know. I have a thought. Or because this is what happened to me, um, they they feel so guilty all the time because they do sin, and then they see stuff like that, and they're like, "Well, uh, I got to keep on trying to be better." You know what I mean? The the mind, the mind can really mess with you. Big time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have something I would like to weigh in in this really quick. All right. Um, after Adam and Eve ate of the law, what happened to them? They became conscious of sin and their nakedness. And they were separateness of shame, them. right? Yeah. But yeah. after a while, doesn't your shame become callous and you don't have any more shame? Or even after a while of self-sanctifying yourself, it's like your self-sanctification is now your clothes. You're wrapping yourself in your own self-sanctification, but it's not really a covering like the blood of Christ. Yeah. And so oh, yeah. it's really not. It's not, and it's not an eradication in the first place of what's what's uh, wrong with you uh, on the inside. That 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 it's like the law is a is a God as physician saying, here, let's take a look at this X-ray. Boy, you got something <laughs> in you that needs to be removed. And uh, here's and so here's the cure. But you know, until you see yourself in a in, in a in a second, it can be done as your true condition or who you really are, and it's uh, it it'll drop you to your knees. It, and it, then it's like you're ready. For, then you're ready to take the prescribed dose, uh, the prescribed cure, and that's the faith in Christ. So he can so he can you can be found in Him and have the uh, the knowledge that your sins which all were committed uh, 2,000 years in advance of him going to the cross, are completely buried with him. So the law is, is, the law is good if it's used properly, but if not, uh, and that's, that's why the Sermon on the Mount is not a, uh, it's not a, let's, let me get up here and give you an encouraging word, folks. It's, 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 it's actually him as minister to the, uh, the circumcision, those under the law, giving them the law in its full dose, straight up, no dilution whatsoever. Here it is. How you doing with it? Not too, not very good, are you? Yeah, that's what it's supposed to do. Yeah. 
Tanya, uh, you want to elaborate on this any bit? I've got a few things I want to add before we move on, but I want you to have a chance to elaborate. Um, I, was, I was just thinking about um, this video that I found on one of my old computers recently that I made two years ago, and I was in a different mindset then. And I, I said in there that the law of God did, isn't what drew me to God because in fact it actually scared the crap out of me <laughs> and made me kind of like almost want to run away from him but I knew I couldn't and that but it was actually his mercy and grace that is what drew me to him and it took me a while cuz you know I'm real insecure uh you know about stuff like that and it so it took me a while but yeah the law is it's scary I mean there's no compassion in it there's no it's, Love it's, in it. It's meant to kill you. It's meant yeah. to kill you. Yeah. Terrible. All right, go ahead. Okay, uh, I'll go. Uh, we're going to go on, but let me kind of sum up a couple of points here. Uh, first of all, we cited various examples already in this study over the last few episodes of how um, man's attempt to solve this problem, this alienation, this separation from God, uh, man's attempt to do that has always been an utter failure. From Adam and Eve trying to cover themselves with leaves, that wasn't that wasn't cutting it. So God covered them with a the skin of an animal. There had to be bloodshed. And then uh, Cain uh, provided a sacrifice that was from farming through the labor of his hands, through his own work. And God wasn't satisfied because he was trying to piece God through his work. And, but Abel offered a blood sacrifice, and God was pleased. So, and uh, even uh, uh, James said that uh, he said he said if you offended at one point, you've offended at all. In other words, if you want to be justified by the law, you have to keep the commandments, uh, all the laws, perfectly, and, or else you're guilty or you're a sinner. If you sin one time, you're labeled as a sinner. And, and uh, Jesus said, "Go and be perfect," and no one who, in their right mind, can claim that they've achieved that. Uh, Jesus at the uh, when he told the rich young man to sell everything he owned and come follow him, and the young man was dejected and left, his apostles said, well, if, if, uh, how is it, uh, if a rich, Jesus said, it, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. And his apostles said, well, if that's the case, how is it possible for anyone to get saved? And Jesus said, with man it is impossible. Listen, people, if you try to be justified and get right with God through your own efforts. Jesus said, with man it is impossible. But with God, it is possible. Jesus said, with man it is impossible. With God, it is possible. Because he loved us so much, he became a man. He, he died for our sins to make it possible. Because we couldn't do this on our own. Uh, so, anybody want to say one thing before we move on to the next verse? Just that, uh, yeah, I, I, I always love that story of the the young guy who comes and says, "From youth, I've been doing all all that you've been saying," and uh, it, it 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 can come off harsh, I think, what Jesus said to him, but it's actually very loving, you know, because he was just, he was showing him a truth in the hopes that he would go, "Okay, I'm I'm not all that in the bag of chips. <laughs> I can't part with this. I'm unable to part with this particular aspect of my life." So uh, you know, I I have. It'll be interesting to see someday, uh, you know, when we are fully known and know all things. Whether and I'm sure the guy, man, I'm hoping that he turned and was saved by God's grace and mercy after he saw that about himself. So it's yeah. a great, uh, great story, great truth illustrated there. Okay, very good. Let's. Uh, so uh, these are. I'm going to read a, a couple of notes I have from some um, a commentary on this. And it says the promise of the old covenant was principally that God would give physical blessings. God promised good crops, many children, rain at the proper time, milk and honey, and freedom from attacks from their enemies. Because the sacrifice in the New Covenant was unblemished spiritually, not physically, the blessings under the Second Covenant is spiritual. It includes forgiveness of sin and the relationship with God. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. That's Ephesians 1.3. Uh, so, 
And then the, uh, the rest of that chapter talks about uh, uh, all these very spiritual blessings. So the, the, the point here really is that the, the real purpose of all these laws was so that the Jews could get physical blessings and make it to the Promised Land. And, uh, but, but the blessings that, that we get uh, is, is it's spiritual. We're going to get treasures in heaven. We get, we get salvation and so on by trusting Jesus. So um, it's totally different. Uh, we do things, uh, and it's all spiritual. And uh, not that we don't get uh, some kind of blessings in life too. Like, like maybe you get fatter if you if you serve the Lord, right? <laughs> if, if being fat shows that you, shows that you're prosperous. Oh, that was just my attempt at humor. <laughs> <laughs> well, gonna... I don't want to follow the law or the Lord because I don't want to get fat. <laughs> I know, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> you know, you can talk about a diet plan, don't follow God. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah, so it's so imperative to, to see what you just pointed out, that it was... Uh, signs and wonders and physical manifestations and blessings that uh, the other nations could see because that was God's purpose that they'd be a light that uh, you know here's my family now how are all you other families out there doing that uh, don't know me or don't recognize me or dancing around uh, uh, idols and you know, calling it God you know look at this, this group as compared to you and so uh, but today it's that's not the same it's not the same thing so this idea of you know who has genuine faith or real faith or saving faith forget about it you're not gonna know you know you're not gonna know till that day that God reveals the secrets of men's hearts did you really believe the simple gospel yeah and in a sense you can make observations it's like when somebody's forever talking about the sin problem I'm going well maybe uh, maybe you don't got maybe you don't have the gospel right because it says that he died for our sins, and that he was buried. You know, and he took those with him, and he was raised. So, I mean, it's like, so what? Sin problem? What sin problem? It, it, it that's not glorifying to God. It's like you know, the, the truth is, he took care of something that we could never take care of on our own. So, uh, it's it's you got to know, you got to realize that it, this, it's we have heavenly blessings. We're blessed in the spiritual realms, and the, and when Peter makes reference to. Uh, uh, by his stripes we're healed, not of our diseases. If you read that passage carefully, you'll see that we're healed of a uh, spiritual uh, uh, problem that uh, that we couldn't take care of. It's, it's by his stripes we've been made whole, you know, holy and uh, right in his sight and all these things. But as far as uh, life goes on, ups and downs and everything else, it's not a, you know you can't if you start making him a god of circumstance you're going to be forever navel gazing and going what am I doing wrong because I lost my job and my dog hates me or whatever you know it's, see it's apart from that it's it's on the inside it's an inside game today and also I think our perspective uh, and I've said this many times uh, trying to make the point that don't expect every Christian to be identical in terms of you know how they're living your life and how spiritual they appear to be and so on if you want to like look at other people and evaluate them we're not all the same uh, some of us embrace the promptings of the Holy Spirit and you get transformed and some people resist the promptings of the Spirit and they don't seem to grow and mature very much um, but uh, when we when we do uh, put our faith in, in Jesus and get the Holy Spirit then we will get some transformation in, in, in us, but it's all a matter of degrees. You know, everybody's, everybody's different. Uh, now, I wanna, I've got a little chart here that I'm looking at, and it, it says that uh, prefigure in the law of Moses on one column and realization in the law of Christ. So we know about the law of Moses, the law of Christ. Anybody want to throw out what the law of Christ would be? Love. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Love. So, um, the, yeah, the, he, he gave us this uh, uh, commandment uh, and to, to love one another. And uh, it's called, I think it's called the royal law. And what James referred to as the royal law. And, and, that's when, and Paul said that uh, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And if you like KJV, faith, hope, and charity, which, which means love. If you're charitable, you're showing love. Uh, so, 
Um, we, we get these spiritual things like, well, uh, we're uh, adopted as sons of God, we receive grace, redemption, forgiveness of sins, and we get sealed with the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, these are spiritual gifts, and they were all shadowed and pictured in the Old Testament in other, in other ways. So I'm going to go through this, and you tell me what you, if you think this is a valid comparison here. Uh, prefigure in the Law of Moses, we got obedience to, to physically, physically defined rules required, and they were blessed. And we have obedience to spiritual principles. Now, what does it mean? We know what obedience to the laws of Moses were. But what does it mean, obedience to spiritual principles? What, what would a spiritual principle be? Uh, what we just uh, mentioned is love. We're, we're, we're told, we're not told to uh, follow the commandments, but we're told other things. We're told to love each other. Okay? And so that would be a spiritual principle. We're also told to forgive. So these are spiritual concepts. These are not actual uh, physical laws. about. Uh, that I guess what the fruit of the Spirit would be like that sort of too well anything that when we walk in this in the spirit when it says you know walk after the spirit not after the flesh of yeah. course that spirit yeah. is God in us and that spirit is loving and kind and merciful and and uh, non-judgmental uh, all that good good fuzzy warm stuff okay so uh, a prefigure would be uh, Obedience to physically defined rules required in the Law of Moses, and uh, that would be a picture of as a Christian, uh, it's not obedience to those physical laws, it's just obedience to physical, to spiritual principles. Love each other, forgive yeah. each other, those things, and the other things that you, you mentioned. I don't remember the list of things on that uh, section. Well, uh, I, I think that you have to, you have to um, connect that with the Gospel itself. You have to connect that to Christ Himself. The Spirit testifies of Christ, which testifies of God's love for us, which changes our hearts to make us able to live by grace and love other people. So walking by the Spirit and God's command to love is to walk in Christ's love. So it, it, it kind of goes like round, like round in a circle here, that when we're loved, then we love others. But uh, this, if I don't love my neighbor perfectly, mm -hmm. if I get aggravated at my neighbor, will I be condemned under Christ's law? No. no. That's the good part. Yeah. <laughs> I, would, it, I would do it, something wrong, but that doesn't mean I'll be condemned because I'm still under God's love. To, right. put, it, to, put, it, to put it simply, it's, I say it's the difference between... Uh, in times past being God-like as opposed to now realizing that now Christ is in you, the fullness of the Godhead is in you, it's no longer you that lives but Christ within you. So we're called to know Him and the more we know of Him and what He has done, uh, the more faith uh, we have, that, and not even in our own faith, but we just, be, we just become more knowledgeable about our true identity and position and we relax and it's like what a relief! I'm, you know, those last two laws were the killers for me. It's like love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. But what about the nights I want to watch Ray Donovan, you know, kick badass on TV? So, you know, well, better you know eliminate. It's still law, and love one another as you love yourself. You know, it's like uh, it's it, you know, it, but those are removed too. It's it's the law of uh, of, of yeah. in Christ that it were to be. Walking but, uh, but we are promised uh, spiritual blessings by following spiritual principles, too. So, uh, yeah, we, and we all do it to varying degrees. Some people uh, are much more loving. Uh, it's the work of the Spirit uh, transforming them. I'll tell you this. Uh, my, I don't think in any of my videos I've ever really talked about my life before I got saved very much. Uh, uh, I'm not going to really go into great detail tonight, but I'll, I'll, I'll just say that uh, the kind of person that I was is like 180 degrees. 
than from who I am now. Um, I could give you probably a dozen names of friends of mine who are in prison or dead because of the kind of activities that we, we did. They, they did it, they got caught, or they died, and I fared somehow. So, um, the, and the kind of person that I am today is 180 degrees different. Now, the transformation in me that I don't like to talk about very often, but it's relevant to this, it is was never one ounce by my own effort. Any changes, people who have known me for the last 40 years, and, and look at me now and can, can see the change, those changes were not uh, accomplished by one ounce of my own effort. The Spirit gradually transformed me. It, tra it changed me immediately in some ways, and then over a, a lifetime, it's changed me in other ways, and I'm a completely different person than I was. And just the fact that the, 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 my main interest, my, the most fun thing I can think of doing is what we're doing right now, talking about our great Savior, God, Jesus Christ. Amen. How many really? years, ago, years ago, the idea of spending an hour or two talking about Jesus, would that be fun for any of us before? No. no. So we, that's what we love now because we're a new creature. But I did not accomplish these changes through my own effort. And it's just like I didn't get saved through my own effort, but my transformation wasn't through my own effort. These were all the work of God. Yeah. And to, you, to any uh, works enthusiasts who uh, happen to stop by, <laughs> of which uh, Mitch uh, used to be one, and I uh, sort of slipped back into that at one point, uh, consider that uh, we're, if you're in Christ, that you're his workmanship, that he created this new you, put his son's life in you, put his spirit in you, and that uh, you were created for a purpose to do good works, yeah, good works that he's prepared in advance for you to do so that you might walk in them uh, and, and really take no credit for it. That's, that's the main thing. It's like it, if, if you stick to where you're supposed to be, and that's in the New Testament and the Pauline epistles, the gospel of grace administrator, you'll see that it eliminates anything that you could take credit for. It's a pride buster, and that's what really God is after. Get rid of the pride and uh, get the love of Christ in you. Can okay. I say something real quick? Yes, um, I agree with what Scott just said big time. And now that I think about it, when I think of all the New Testament scripture that I've read, nowhere are we supposed to take any credit for any of the good that we do after we become Christians. And so right, right on, brother. And also, I just wanted to say... Um, what you were saying earlier, Luke, I did what you said and took a note because I would have forgotten this. <laughs> but you said, you know, if we follow spiritual, I can't remember how you worded it, if you said spiritual laws or spiritual principles. principles, okay. If we follow that, that we are blessed. And that's true. And that almost mirrors what we were just reading in Deuteronomy, even though back then it was the law that you had to do. If, if you... Basically, if you do what God says, whether that be back in Old Testament times when it was the law that he said, or whether you do what God says today with Christ in us and he says it in our hearts now, you're going to get blessed. And I, I just thought, I thought that was kind of cool. Because, see, I've been, I've been kind of wondering a lot about the Old Testament lately, how mean God seemed to be compared to how nice and almost liberal Jesus was when he was walking this earth. So um, so that was a blessing I just got just now. There, there, there's no contradiction there at all. Tony, I'm not, I don't want to say this to um, any attempt to put some of the embarrassment to you. You've said this yourself, uh, I believe, publicly before, is that you haven't read the Bible from cover to cover yet, have you? No, not fully. I have not. Okay. Uh, you, if you go back, you start from the beginning and you read it all the way through, and particularly maybe even a paraphrase of, instead of just following a KJV or something, because it will be, it'll be more clear to you if you read a modern language or a paraphrase, and you go through it and you're looking back through this lens, you're going to see, understand a lot of these things that the preconceptions you have about this angry God and so on, uh, 
we've already, the whole point of this subject is to tell us that the real point of the Old Testament is to point us to the Savior and the blood of sacrifice. And, and, uh, so it's all yeah. through the Old Testament. And there's other things like the history uh, and then even, even the um, genealogies. Genealogies are boring. I do speed reading through them when I read those, okay? But guess what? Everything in there does prove a point. And everything in there is God breathed. Uh, so the, the whole, all of the scriptures, I believe, is inspired word of God, even though some of it seems like it's just like boring or it doesn't seem relevant or it's just Jewish history or whatever. But everything, when we talk about all these stories in the Bible, well, every one of these stories makes a point. Uh, you know, we, we talked about the story of covering themselves with the leaves versus be, being uh, covered with the, the, the blood, the animal uh, skin. Uh, see, people wouldn't understand that unless they think, well, that's just a story. But there's, there's a valuable message in every story, every historic event. It's just that over time, it takes a long time to learn those things and understand them. i got the next another thing to move on to, but uh, if anybody wants to uh, comment on that, can, can I can I say something real quick? Yeah. Because um, if you're a young believer and you uh, haven't uh, read the, the whole Bible, I, I just you know everybody's different, you know, and we're drawn to Christ by the by by the Father by His Spirit, and so some people, I think, uh, honestly try to uh, read the Bible to find fault with it, and if they're being intellectually honest, become uh, believers, and other people uh, have maybe conversion experiences that are a little sort of maybe supernatural and some people take umbrage with that and don't believe God is operating that way. My my salvation was you know, wacky, <laughs> but it was needed because I, you know, I had a youth like yours with a lot of substance abuse and fun times and all that stuff. So, But the point is once once you're in the body of Christ and you, and you want to learn more of him and, uh, and and study the Bible, I would avoid, and I did this and I wish I hadn't, somebody suggested years ago that you can read the Bible in one year, you know, by reading a chapter of the old, chapter of the new, a psalm and a proverb, and uh, at the end of the year I was, I had more questions than I could, you know, and it was just, it was confusing. You can do it from start to finish, and, and, it's, and it's not complicated. I mean, there was a character in the Old Testament that uh, was asked, do you understand that? And he said, uh, how, how can I, unless somebody shows me? You know? So there's plenty of good Bible teachers, and, uh, they'll, and, and they'll take you along, and it'll, uh, you'll grow in, uh, in comfort and awareness of uh, God's uh, provision for us today in the age of grace, because it's you just can't, uh, there's so, I mean, there's certain rules that apply. You know, you have to, that which makes uh, Plain sense is good sense, and uh, don't look for any other sense after that. Some things are very clearly stated. You can't take one scripture that contradicts uh, security of salvation when uh, there an abundance uh, that, uh, that emphasize that you're secure in Christ. There's a lot of different genres within the Bible. Um, you know, Psalms is poetry. Job is uh, epic drama. You've got an historical account of his people, and uh, you, you have to, so you have to know who's talking to whom and in what particular context. Otherwise, uh, you know, you, you'll take a, a, a statement uh, that is very condemning, and uh, and you you lose sight of the grace. So step back from that Bible, keep the grace lens on, and uh, tr you know, read it in continuity, start to finish, because it's a narrative that, that takes you. Uh, it becomes everly, increasingly bright for all of those who are righteous in His sight. And the good wine always comes later, but you got to take it start to finish and keep things in order. I'm, I want to issue a complaint against Tanya right now. Tanya, you ready? Tanya? Lay it on me, brother. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know I won that Bible trivia contest, and I, I'm going to get my fudge. But you fudged, yes. you fudged, I should have had an extra point for the Ethiopian eunuch. Oh, you that's what, that. oh, yeah. That's what I was that's, thinking. That's why the reason I'm thinking of that now is because he's talking <laughs> about that story where the Ethiopian eunuch asked Philip, he says, yeah, I don't understand it unless someone tells me what it means. And that was Philip witnessing to the Ethiopian eunuch at that time. So that made me think of that point that I didn't get. Because you, oh, okay, I, yeah. I said, All right, that's another subject. Let's, let's go on to, oh, maybe Mitch will want to comment on this too, but since you're talking about how to read the Bible, my advice to people who want to read the Bible is simple. 
find the Gospel of John, called the Book of John. Read it ten times through. Read it all the way through ten times before you do anything else. Uh, and you'll understand that we get salvation just simply by believing in Jesus as our Savior. And then you read the letters of Paul and read them. That's Romans through Philemon. Read those each ten times. And then do that before you read any other part of the Bible. And once you get that ingrained on that, and that is your foundation, then you can start from Genesis 1 and you can, you can understand it all. Mitch, do you have anything to say about all this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> well, uh, thank goodness. <laughs> thank goodness I have I some. Put my feet up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had mentioned in a, in a video I did about a, a children's Bible that uh, I recommended to read because the children's Bible was uh, it, it was a very straightforward uh, telling of, of the Bible itself. It was much easier to read, and it was basically the way I really started to understand the scriptures. I started off with a child's Bible first. Um, also, um, I would say that the Bible has many pitfalls, and the reason why is because when we read it, we often get caught up in misinterpretations or ideas, especially if we hear it from different preachers here and there. So to read before and after and to really thoroughly read it over and over again is very important because there's a lot of times when we read something and we misinterpret exactly what was read. And along with that, I'd like to also mention the Jews that do read through their Bible, the Tanakh, uh, within a year, and they read it in Hebrew, uh, and at the end of the at the end of the year, they get drunk and they, they dance with the Torah because it's the Torah, and they dance with it in Sinhas Torah. Uh, but it is but it is something that I've always wanted to do, uh, in the actual language itself. Start with the Jews and read through, along with the commentary. Of course, they have a Rashi commentary with it, to keep up with um, those uh, 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 the, the the scriptures that way. And the boring parts of the genealogies, I have to say that the Jews don't look at it as boring as we do. And the reason why is because they know, the, they know well, this people was the spawning of this nation over here. And they were, they were these people on the side of the Jews. And this person's genealogy became the Palestine. And this people became the Ishmaelites. And this people came... Uh, and so they know the regions and the lands and the history and how it played in with their history. So the genealogies become much more alive when you really start to delve into them. But anybody who's a new believer, I would say that kind of stuff, it's going to take an awful lot of time to peel the, the um, you know, peel that onion back and see the different facets. And as you grow, and the, the interesting thing is that it's great that we don't know everything at first. It would be so boring if we knew everything. It's great to have, you start off with little revelations, and then and then God says, "Boom! Look at this." You're like, "Oh, whoa! Well, I didn't never saw that before," you know. And um, I would say it's a journey, and looking and and definitely looking for the idea of the gospel, and and then reading and reading through it to make sure that when you read it, sometimes, like I have taken a lot of videos where I have explained where many people misinterpreted things like the parable of the uh, of the pearl of great price you know and and that many people think the pearl of great price has to do with us selling everything we have to follow God when in reality if you look at it it's Christ selling everything he has and dying on the cross for his precious pearl his church oh. wow wow his inheritance, God's inheritance, <laughs> us. <laughs> We're the pearl. Yeah. When that's you look great. at the parable, if you look at it, you can look at it from a works background. Everybody sell everything you have for Christ. That's not what it says. It's talking about the, the kingdom of God is like Jesus Christ coming and, and and buying you, and that's how special you should feel as a yeah. child of God in love. Wow, that's awesome, brother. That's really All right, uh, uh, I want to move on to the next point unless someone has something that needs to be said. Okay, we're comparing now this. I have a column of ideas called Prefigure in the Law of Moses and another column, Realization in the Law of Christ. 
And uh, we lost Mitch. I hope we can get back. All right. Uh, the next one is com the comparing in the, the law of Moses ceremonial uncleanness. And in the realization of the law of Christ, that would be compared. Oh, there he is. Good. Mitch, you got back just in time because this next point I was counting on you. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was praying. <laughs> Bring him back. Quick. Yeah. Okay. Well, now we're doing this comparison chart here. Uh, on one side, we got things that prefigure in the law of Moses, and the other column, realization in the law of Christ. And tell me how if this is a valid comparison. On what on the Moses law side, I have ceremonial uncleanness, and then realization in the law of Christ is sin and separation from God. Okay, hold on. Plug you in. Okay, go ahead again. I'm sorry. Okay, uh, with with the law of Moses, there's an idea called ceremonial uncleanness, and then uh, yes, and, and, and then as as uh, in the, in the law of Christ, we have the idea of sin and separation from God. Right. Okay. So are these um, a proper comparison? Well, ceremonially unclean. Um, it's funny because I think about the Jews, they, they have to follow kosher laws, obviously, in order to follow the mitzvah. So um, I'm, I'm just trying, I'm going to move this because I think I'm losing reception. Um, okay. So in some ways I would say, yes, um, um, you know, if, 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 you, if you don't follow the ceremonial laws, you know, you're, you're uh, unclean. Um, or unkosher, you know. I mean, uh, uh, but a lot of those laws were precursors to to the image of Christ. So, you know, um, you know, there was the washing of hands and all of the things that these meant, and a lot of these laws were pointing to Christ Himself. So, so um, is the valid comparison to say that the Samar the Jewish idea of ceremonial uncleanness? Is a picture of us in a uh, sin, uh, in, in a state of sin and separated from God before before uh, uh, our salvation and before the cross. Well, I would I would I would think yes. I'm uh, you know I mean the way I'm looking at it is is that that um, if we're ceremonially unclean, we're not we're not we're not in. We're not looking towards, or we're not following the laws uh, that that would um, uh, would that would show what the Old Testament was pointing to. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if I'm hearing really well. I'm trying to set this up so it doesn't go back out again. So, okay, I want to ask Scott to comment. Uh, ceremonial and cleanness of the Jews is it a picture of uh, man's uh, separation from God? In, because of sin. Uh, yeah, and I think it says something about judgment in, in, in those days and probably a judgment to come, not for us who are in Christ because there's no condemnation uh, for us uh, now or ever uh, because we've been declared not guilty and justified by faith alone, but uh, there's going to be a judgment of nations. And it, 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 I think one of the things it pointed out was uh, uh, if, if if the time, when the time came to be uh, to have those put under the, the blood back in those days, if it was done improperly, even if you know, even if you were like maybe the, one of the better you know, members of your particular tribe, uh, you're still it's, it's it affected everyone. The, the, that's, that ceremony sort of brought that out, and also uh, the preparation of the sacrifice. You know, it, it, it points to Christ and a perfect Lamb. It's it's so I I I'm, I wish I was more well versed on Old Testament and I actually uh, started the reading just this past week but I I went through about as much as I went to the uh, seldom tread uh, editorial section of my local paper but uh, it's it in light of grace you do start to see things but uh, Mitch is far more knowledgeable on it and uh, but that's just something that comes to mind is in terms of judgment we there's so there's a lot of different judgments. You know, back then, and and it declared not guilty now, and the judgment of the nations to come. So even if you're uh, even if you were a good uh, 
uh, Irish guy, uh, you're, you're being judged with the nation of Ireland, you know, and, and, and I don't know how that works. It's like not for us to know, apparently, all the details now, but it's coming. Uh, to tell you, I'm a Protestant. <laughs> that's the important, yeah, that's the... My mother and, and, was Catholic, though, I was kicked out. <laughs> yeah, and, and the, uh, the conflict in the northernmost counties up in Belfast. Is let, me just, ask, let me ask Tanya a question. I, um, I, since you haven't read the, the Old Testament completely yet, I, I'm... <laughs> is that you or, or Benjamin? That was, that was Ben. <laughs> was trying Benjamin. to keep him happy, yes. Okay, the idea of uh, ceremonial uncleanness. Now, uh, there was a high priest that would go on the other side of the veil in the presence of God. Mm -hmm. and he had to go through this ceremonial cleaning process to make himself so he could go over the, through, on the other side once a year. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we discussed earlier that the veil is, is a picture of our separation from God because of us being unclean because of sin. Mm -hmm. So, And then we know that when Jesus died on the cross and paid for all the sin of everyone who ever lived, then the veil was torn open and this veil that was uh, separated man from having access to God now was open. So no, every man has access to God because the veil was torn open. And Jesus right. died for our sins. So, is this uh, does this all fit with the idea of being ceremonial and unclean, and the Jewish way of looking at things, and then uh, the fact that spiritually our sin uh, kept us separate from God, but Jesus ended up uh, removing that as a barrier. Sin is no longer a barrier between man and God. Yes, and uh, it just so happens that um, I am trying to get through the, the Bible from start to finish. I'm in Leviticus now, so I just read all the stuff about um, God telling them like exactly down to the detail what exactly they have to do for these sacrifices and ceremonies and what the priests do and all of this stuff. And in my opinion, it's, it's simply because God had a nation of people Okay, there was lots of people in the world then, and they were all worshiping their false gods and being crazy. And there was a particular people that God called His own and wanted to do. Wanted, he wanted them to do what He said to make them different from everyone else. And um, yeah, they basically grew up. And when I say you know grew up, I mean just the nation as a whole for the thousands of years, they grew up knowing that they were sinners, whereas other nations didn't. Their gods certainly didn't point that out, as far as I know. So, um, And then here comes Jesus saying, okay, yeah, the Jews were right, everybody is sinners, but now everybody's welcome. You know, surprise, or whatever. So I guess that's my thoughts on that. I think it's really cool. Yeah, that's good, and I'm glad you're uh, as you're going through this particular part of the Old Testament. A lot of it's going to relate to what we're covering now. Uh, and now we got another comparison. Uh, in in the Law of Moses, sacrifice bridges the chasm between law and effort. In other words, uh, what man's effort can accomplish and what and what the law requires, there's a gulf. And so they had sacrifices to make up for that, that difference. Now, uh, the same, but now, Jesus, uh, whatever effort man has is insufficient, but Jesus' sacrifice it covers, covers that difference because the Bible says we all fall short of the glory of God. <laughs> so, so uh, because no matter how hard we try, we're going to fall short of this perfection God requires. Jesus had to uh, cover this chasm uh, through his sacrifice. So, uh, Mitch, is that a, a valid comparison? I think it is. Okay. And Scott? Absolutely. 
I mean, ceremony itself involves us doing something. That's what the, that's the problem with religion. Is they're trying to justify themselves by what they do. It's a ceremony. Things acted out before God, and God is always looking at the inside, judging motive and intent. And uh, so, uh, the ceremony of, of then is, was done away with once and for all with the shed blood of Christ, which gives you uh, an idea of how powerful the blood is and the sufficiency of his grace and uh, so it's uh, and there was one other thing that I'm drifting it's it's terribly hot <laughs> so, yeah I'm, I'm in the heat right now but I, I'd like to, to, to say that the, the the Old Testament religion yeah was pointing to Christ so yeah it was basically religion was pointing to the end of religion you yeah know, the religious things that they were doing, the reason why they were doing them and the reason why those things were there were they were shadows of things to come. Yeah, and, and, and it, should, it should, make you, should make you appreciative and uh, give a sigh of relief to what, what a wonderful age the age of grace is, that uh, you know, we don't have to go through all that. And as far as, uh, as, far as the other nations, it, God, it, you know, it, it wasn't that he didn't love them. You know, and what is the passage, Luke, about the, that in former times he winked you know, it was like he was aware of what they were doing, but he, he was able to wink at, uh, at, at their, and they weren't even sins because they didn't have a contract with him. The law wasn't given to them. So technically, and God is fair, that uh, he, he couldn't be charging them with anything. If they, you know, it was their own conscience that either convicted them at that time. And, uh, you know, so uh, I, uh, I'm, 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 it's frustrating because I lost sight of what I had. There was something that I wanted to, well, go, go on. It'll maybe come back to me or not. It's no big deal. Another comparison, of course, we talked about that uh, they, they had the sacrifice of bulls and goats, and we have the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We talked about how they had a high priest as their mediator, and we have Jesus Christ as our high priest, our mediator. Uh, they had laws, rules, and regulations for behavior. We have behavior based upon spiritual principle and love. Uh, they had tithing, and we have sacrifice and giving from the heart. Uh, they have the Sabbath, and uh, we have come, I will give you rest, relying on Jesus. And they had death, and we have life. I remembered what it was. <laughs> and, and, and you cited uh, uh, the passage in Romans, I think it's chapter 3, uh, uh, that uh, all have sinned and uh, come short of the glory of God. And if you look at, uh, I, it, it, it's actually a, a present ongoing tense. It's all have sinned and are continually coming short and falling. Yeah. So it's, it's, this goes in, in, uh, in, in line with what Jesus said, that he didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. But that does not mean that, that we're supposed to go back and fulfill the law and what would Jesus do. It's, it's what, what Jesus has done. It's a recognition of that. And this idea of uh, if you love him, you'll keep his commandments and keep sin out of your life. I, I'm sorry. You haven't been brought to a full revelation of, of what has been accomplished. And until you do, uh, you're going to be a legalistic, religious person. And uh, they're the hardest people to reach. You know, they, they, they honest, it's like, well, now that I've come to Christ, now that I've come to him, not that the Father drew me to him, but I've come to Christ, and I've repented of my sins, and now I'm doing this, and you should too. It's like you're clearly not seeing yourself accurately because the Bible says you're a liar with that. It says that they all have sinned and continually come short of the glory of God. While you're in this flesh, you always will. Now, this old system, everything we've been discussing is, part of this old religious system of Judaism. Uh, the Apostle Paul uh, wrote at least two books uh, arguing the point that uh, you've got to separate yourselves from the old religious system of Judaism. The book of Galatians, he calls them foolish Galatians because they wanted to keep Judaism and make it part of Christianity. Uh, and then uh, in Hebrews, I think he called them Judaizers, and they, they still wanted to keep all these sacrifices and all these religious things that they were doing. And in both of these books, the argument is you cannot mix your Judaism with this Christianity. They are two totally different things. Judaism, if you understand it, is what we're discussing. It's pictures of this 
coming Savior in Christianity is, okay, it's finished. The Savior came. We're, sa we're saved when we trust Him. And don't try to mix them together and keep us following this old religion because you nullify the grace of God if you try to mix them together. Yes. One, uh, here's a, um, a paragraph from a commentary that I found. Is, the former covenant was inadequate in that it was based on human effort and physically unblemished sacrifices rather than on the blood of the unblemished life of Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, the law of Moses served a great purpose. It led us to Christ. Physical blessing uh, based on unachievable perfect obedience gave way to spiritual blessing based upon reliance on the only one who ever lived a perfect life, Jesus Christ. That's a pretty good paragraph. Boy, is it ever. Yeah. This okay. idea, this, this idea of, you know, that if you commit one sin, you're guilty of it all. Oh, well, that was a long time ago, though, that I did that. Still there. Mark is still there. You know, <laughs> until until you make the exchange and find a new identity in Christ, it's still going to be there. And conversely, the second you put your faith in Christ, just as Jesus said in John six forty seven, He who believes on me has eternal life, and it's irrevocable, you know, because the, the, all the sins were taken care of. It's an instantaneous thing, and it's because it's a spiritual thing that it can be so. As long as you're you know, outside that law of the spirit of life, you're always going to be striving and working and doing, and it's all conditional, and it never really takes care of the problem. You're on a hamster wheel. So uh, it's, uh, you know, that's, and I, I believe also it's uh, the temptation in the wilderness. And you cry, and Satan said, if, if, you'll just, if you'll just bend your knee once and worship me, you know, it would have all gotten overturned. Mm -hmm. let's, let's talk about, uh, I, I don't know, which of you have discussed with uh, recently the glow on Moses' face? The Shekinah. Yeah, and it and it, it faded away. Uh, do you think that that is uh, in any way a picture of something that we should understand? Yes. Okay. I do. I think I think it's indicative of what was to come later on, especially most notably in the in the Book of Acts which is very hard for a lot of people to understand because it seems to contradict itself on some, in so many, particularly in regards to salvation. You know, Cornelius' family, uh, they believe and they're saved. The jailer is told, just believe on Christ and you're saved. Uh, others are told, repent and be baptized in chapter 2. So which is it? You know, one was fading and another was uh, taking a hold of the new reality, but it wasn't... Uh, it, it you know it, 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 I, we said this on the phone the other night you know you're you're you, if you're steering and guiding a big ship to go in another direction there are certain moves and transitions you make it doesn't come instantaneously and uh, this orb that we're on spinning through space and the human race is it doesn't come to all people overnight instantly it was a transition that you see going on I, I think that, uh, Mitch I want to ask you to comment on this but let me Paul he, look, because he just said that I need to elaborate on something. Uh, I don't know how you came up with it, Scott, uh, but to me it, it was a, just a beautiful illustration of dispensation, how it, how it really happens in, in my opinion. And, it, and a lot of people believe that there's several different dispensations and that they are actually clear-cut dates and events where a new dispensation starts and another one ended. And uh, I think your, your analogy of if you have a big ocean liner, uh, and it's got to make a turn. It takes a, a very slight turn over a long period of time before it can kindly circumvent and go another way. Um, and it, it can't make a hairpin turn and immediately just turn around and go the other way. And as I see these, this, uh, this uh, revelation in dispensationalism, dispense, dispensation or dispense means... Uh, God dispenses or reveals more and more information to us uh, from the beginning of the, the, the Bible all the way through, and now we have a complete revelation of the Savior and salvation. Back mm -hmm. then, it was being gradually dispensed, and, and, and it wasn't like all of a sudden on one day, uh, I think in Clarence Larkin's book and, and, uh, and Dr. Buckland, they believe there are seven separate dispensations and certain events key to each one of these dispensations. But I see it as a flowing, continuous arc 
of gradually receiving more and more information being dispensed to us. The only clear-cut division that I believe that there really is is the cross, and that is people look up, up into the future for this salvation through a sacrifice, uh, and, and, and now we look back at the cross and see that the sacrifice is accomplished. Yeah, and, and I've heard people say that uh, you know he's the same today, yesterday, and forever, and then use that as an argument to, you know, that he expel, still expects obedience to you know the law and this, and that's just, uh, it, it's again, you know, it's a broader um, definition of him. He doesn't change in the sense that uh, look, he's always required faith. Uh, to you always had to believe something, you know, for salvation, even in the Old Testament, whether it be you know a, a snake nailed to a a tree that was held up, or you know, uh, you, uh, I'm, you had to believe by faith to you know that a rain was going to come, and I'm going to build an ark, you know, because it looks sunny to me. <laughs> and actually, the world had never seen rain at that time, so uh, you know, it was it's always faith that saves. It's Which just what, what you have to believe. What you have to believe in changes. And today, you have to believe that your sins were taken care of. Otherwise, you're going to condemn yourself or allow yourself to be condemned by others, you know, seen and unseen. Uh, whispering in your ear, you're not worthy, this and that, God doesn't want to talk to you, he's not going to help you, all this kind of stuff. It's going to prevent that union that he's already uh, you know, guaranteed to, uh, you the second you believe. I know Mitch is anxious to say something. Yeah, s slightly. I mean, I think you guys really kind of covered it. Uh, and some of the things that Scott said and some of the things that you say kind of tie it together. But just looking at the idea that the, the, the glory was fading from Moses' face, and he had to wear a veil to cover that. Um, isn't that a picture of the Old Testament itself and the law itself? The law itself is uh, its only pictures and shadows of the fulfillment. And as it says in the scriptures, that the time will come when he'll pour out his spirit, you know, and, 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 and you know, he'll take the old heart of stone and put in a new heart of flesh, and no one will have to teach their brother anymore, for everyone will know the Lord. And in in what Scott was saying about New Testament and Old Testament uh, Jews and, and, and Gentiles before, you know, how they keep going back to, to, to religion, but the religion points to the Savior, Jesus Christ, the Spirit of Christ. So the real saved Israel was always the ones that had faith in the Messiah to come. Even David, he had a vision. He had, he had written Psalms about about the crucifixion, you know, he 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 didn't he didn't I don't know what he saw exactly, but he definitely got a major picture of of the cross to come. So following the following the law meant you believed you had faith. Following the law with faith meant that you were putting your hope in all of the what the law was pointing to. So I had to make my sacrifice because I knew that when I made that sacrifice, I was showing that I was faithful to the idea the Messiah will come. And in the future, I have faith in. But many Jews, just like many Christians, had faith in religion, had faith in the legalism of the law. So Moses' glory was fading because the law, the Old Testament, like you said, is the gospel concealed. Whereas in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit coming down by the power of Jesus Christ is an everlasting, unfading glory in, in the revelation of Jesus Christ. So I just, it just seems like there's your contrast between your, your, your dispensations of, uh, of there was something there that, that the Old Testament people could see, but only by the Holy Spirit. But when, when, when the time of fulfillment came, the Spirit was poured out. And now we have the gospel, and it's all it, 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 it's all like come to fruition. Mm -hmm. and, and so now we now what's what was in the past was only a shadow, but what we have now is clear and given to us by the Holy Spirit. Uh, Tanya, I want to get your opinion on this. Uh, also, this glow on Moses' face being actually fading. Uh, brother, I had to step away for a minute and make a bottle, and uh, oh, okay. so I missed I missed a little bit. I just came back when I was hearing Mitch talk, which yeah, okay. I thought he had a good point, but sorry. Yeah, yeah mark the time on this uh, video here if you can, and uh, 
because what we just discussed here okay. as far as dispensationalism, I think, is a very important uh, concept. Uh, so, uh, just just as Scott uh, kind of illustrated or pictured dispensations as a giant boat trying to make a turn. This boat doesn't make a, a U-turn immediately, uh, a hairpin turn. It takes a long time for it to make a gradual turn. And I see that that's a picture of Moses' face. He had this Shekinah glory, and then all of a sudden, it's not like a light switch clicked, and all of a sudden there's no glory. It says it faded gradually away. So it's the same kind of thing. This is a gradual thing. Even the book of Acts is commonly taught as what's called a, a transitional book. It didn't just happen like bing, bing, bing. All of a sudden, more through the book of Acts, you should go through it. You see, finally, there's more understanding until they finally get it. You know. Um, you know what? I don't know if this is on topic or not, but because I'm, I'm just going by what you were just saying, but I find that with myself, like all the time, that I'll get like you know, kind of like high on God for a while and be feeling great and just totally connected to Him and at peace and just like, woo, you know. And then life happens. <laughs> and then it slowly just kind of starts, you know, going away, but then I get it again. Do you know what I mean? So I think I know what Moses, I, I don't know if I'm, if I'm making any sense, but I think maybe that might be. Well, I, I think that's, a, that's an example of another thing. Uh, Moses' glow in his face fading away gradually is a picture of, of the uh, gradual fading away of the Judaism and being replaced with Christianity. Uh, oh, I see, I see, okay. Uh, whereas, whereas what you're talking about is really our spiritual walk. And, uh, and sometimes we're growing a lot, sometimes we backslide. I've said this numerous times, I don't believe any Christian is static. We're either growing or we're backsliding to some degree. And maybe ah, that's it, true. Maybe it's maybe it's very very slight and unnoticeable to the to the observer, but uh, you know uh, we're either growing in knowledge and growing in our walk and our trust in the Savior, or or we end up in, uh, falling back a little bit and, and uh, getting interested in other things, and, uh, and all of a sudden we have idolatry that we're, we're our interest, our primary interest something else rather than our Savior. Now let me read for 2 Corinthians 3, 7 through 11. But if the ministration of death, written and engraved in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I think it's very powerful. And one, the phrase that the, with the law, which is administration of death, and Christ came as a minister to the circumcision, those under the law, and uh, it's basically showing you, look, uh, you know, you, I'm I'm sure you're aware that you probably feel you have some problems, but it's a little more severe than that. Here, let me show you your your chart. Uh, you know, here's the law, and it, it and, and it's meant. To kill you, like I said earlier, it, it brings death. You know, in the hopes that you'll turn and be saved by God's grace, so that He can breathe life into you, His His very Spirit. So, uh, this is the problem. You know, people, well, we you know Paul just why is he so adamant about keeping these things separate? You know, it's either by works or by grace, and you know, <laughs> because if you mix the two, or if you dilute the one, or rely, it's like they're uh, become of no effect. You've ruined it. Grace is grace is only if it's served straight up and remains pure. If you put a little bit of something that you have to do in there, uh, well, you're, guess what? All of a sudden, you're unaware of your union with Christ by faith, and you become very conscious of what uh, you should be doing, you know, or one particular aspect that the devil has so kindly pointed out to you. 
uh, where, where the Word of God says that uh, you're, you're, you've died with Him. You know, at the moment you put your faith in Him, you're dead. Dead is dead. <laughs> so don't uh, don't let him bring a, that old man back to life. He he'd love to do it. He wants to get you back on in the ring one on one and fighting with him. But you stay in Christ, That's you know, right. and, and you're fine. So, Mitch, you all settled? You ready to say something? Yeah, well, I'm I'm, I'm heating up here. It's, I think maybe I'm on the hot seat. You know. <laughs> Maybe Every I'm, time I look at him, he's got a different backdrop going on. What yeah, going? The, yeah, exactly. Well, this is the, the 180 uh, view over here. We'll go to 360 and do a full circle pretty soon. Really, Mitch, I think you're just showing off. You're showing off. Uh, he's, 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 he's one of those live on the scene guys like CNN likes to put on. <laughs> Maybe well, he, I want to go out and sin right now. I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, I've got to get... <laughs> uh, anyway, exactly. I don't want to be brought back under the law again. Nobody. But the thing is, is that that this is this is what you hear in churches all the time. Like just today, I was talking to uh, my brother. You just got back from church. I said, "Well, what was the sermon on?" Well, it was how the way, the way our prayers get answered, and how well if we go out and 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 party and sin. And do this, that, the other thing. Should we, should we expect that God answers our prayer? And I said, why not? This is looking at me like I have three heads. How could you expect to be blessed when you went out and sinned last night? Well, first of all, it's a moot point because as a Christian, I, you know, I wouldn't go out and do that unless something provoked me and I got like dejected and I got <coughs> aggravated. And, and mainly I probably would feel bad about it to begin with. But why should I think that a sin that I made makes me any more or any less loved by God when I know that if I do that, then I'm, I'm depending on my righteousness to answer my prayers, prayers instead of Christ's. Mm -hmm. Ah, bingo. Mm -hmm. Good point. And so here you have, I said, yeah, it looks like a great sermon. That's why I don't go to church. Because I know I'd have problems with the pastor because the, because the wisdom of the world creeped into the church and it sounds good on paper. But when you take it to its nth degree, you see that it doesn't work. Yeah, and it, I mean it, it crept into the to the church so big back in the in the in the in the old days. I mean, I mean how long did they hang on to it uh, for 250, 300 years before they immediately brought back a priesthood? Yeah, you know? and then and then, and then created some new spiritual dimensions that I, I'm not entirely convinced of. Oh, he'll be all right. Just keep bringing that money in, and we'll make sure yeah, you're selling on dope. purgatory. <laughs> Right. Well, my brother said, oh, it was a great sermon. I loved it. He was right on target. And I'm looking at him like, really? Have you really thought through? And this is why I try to be thought-provoking, because people don't see the, the, the line of, 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 it looks good, mm -hmm. but when you look at it, you have to look at it through the focus of, well, then does that make my prayers being answered depend on me? And so whose name am I praying it? I pray in the name of Christ, not my own name. My own name is worth nothing. I'm dead. Yeah. So, so when you tell me that that well, God doesn't bless me uh, because I was unrighteous, then you're telling me that, that then I'm 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 trust I'm not I'm trusting in myself. But then they'll say, well, then you can go out and do everything you want. You can go go ahead and sin all you want. I'm like, no. It doesn't work like that. Those, those folks are, we're told, deserve condemnation. Paul said that they should be, they're, they're cursed. Exactly. Uh, those who would make that accusation against anybody who believes in, in the grace of God through Christ. That, that, yeah, but they made that accusation yeah. against Paul, and the Paul yeah. worked harder than all of them. Yeah, and accomplished more. Where were, the, yeah, where were the, where were the twelve? You know, they, I don't think they got out of Jerusalem. And, and, and because look, the directive to them was different than the directive to Paul. They were told that uh, that uh, they should go in, in well, Christ lived not in the way of the Gentile, and then even in the immediate years after the crucifixion, uh, start in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Now, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Even Paul adhered to that for the first uh, couple chapters of Romans, and then it just then it became more and more. Now there's neither Jew nor Greek. You know, so it's a transition, and it's a uh, one of my favorite. Passages is, is in Solomon in a book of wisdom. Is that uh, 
the, uh, he, he's set eternity in our hearts, but nobody knows the start, the scope of God's plan from start to finish, but he does, <laughs> and, and it's not always for us to know, but he, it's being revealed piecemeal through his word, and we're to proclaim uh, the mystery that's, that's hidden Christ, the hidden God. And that it's now Christ within you. It glorifies God to know that, look, he had this all planned from before the foundation of the world. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it instills confidence in you, you know, as opposed to your own flesh and working things out. He's, he really, he's done it all. He worked it out. He had it all planned. And uh, his grace is sufficient and has been ever since uh, he shed the blood 2,000 years ago. So relax. Mm -hmm. <laughs> relax. Can, I, can I say something real yeah. quick? Um, by what Mitch was saying there, I totally know what you mean. And um, you're right in that in our world, in the world, you know, we're conditioned to believe that if you work hard, you're going to reap, reap the benefits. You're going to get rewarded. So, so work hard, do good, and you'll get rewarded for it. I mean, everything from the time we raise our children up to adulthood, that's ingrained in us. So I was thinking that when you were talking about what you were saying about that pastor and all that. But then I thought of something, and this might be a little controversial, so let me know what you guys think. But perhaps God is actually the one who started that line of thinking when he gave Adam his punishment and said, well, now you've got to work hard and sweat and till the ground to get food. You could, so basically, you've got to work hard to get your reward. Well, that's definitely when works happened, when, they, when, when he ate of the law, right? He was under grace, under the tree of life. Then when they were kicked out of the garden, now all of a sudden all this work happened. Oh, I see. Okay, so yeah, grace before that. So then the law, okay, okay, cool, all right. In, in light of what Mitch said about uh, you know uh, prayer and having prayers answered and all that, I think a great harm was done back in the 80s when the, the prosperity message started um, being heard and people take, we're going to have on two fronts. One, it was you got to have more faith. Well, you're, you're not saved by your own faith. You're saved by the faith of Christ. And uh, the other is the addition, the, uh, the definition of abundant life. What does that really mean? You have to start asking yourself, what does abundant life mean? You know, and, and you know, we judge people differently as to whether they're prosperous. Another thing, you, you see people in L.A., especially, driving really high-end cars, cutting people off in traffic. They're in a hurry. They, they're clearly saying, I'm in a hurry and I'm important. But in my <laughs> estimation, it's like, you're in a hurry because you're running out of time. I have eternal life in me. I'm not in a hurry. I'm relaxed. Yeah, and it's it's part of finding that identity. Uh, Jesus didn't ever appear to be particularly rushed, and he seemed to change his plans at a moment's notice. It's like, oh, somebody's you know this is going to go. Let's go there. You know, so it's you know it's knowing being aware of who you are and being led by his spirit, and that that's what should be reflected, and that's the real life. That you're 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 never going to run out of time. You're never going to run out of life because you're you're plugged into uh, the source of all life, the life giving spirit. You're so it's it's crazy how people think. You know, because I used to hear this stuff. You know, oh, you know, you'll get that job or you'll get this car, or this or that. You just have to have more faith. And and people bought it, and I I kind of did to a certain extent because it was before I decided to sit down and read for myself what it says. I saw Mitch raise his hand. Oh, I was just having fun because I love to cut people off. <laughs> and then I go, Jesus loves you. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, and I don't know why you get you get a freeway system down there. That you, a little history on your town. Richard Nixon had that built, an extensive freeway system. Just about all the roads, um, primary roads you have down there, were built uh, prior to the '72 uh, Republican convention, and then Nixon changed his mind and went to Miami. So for years, my friends used to always knock me. They say. Why you know, the radio station you work at? Why do you get traffic reports? You never have any traffic. You've got like ten cars on all these freeways, but it's changed now. You guys drive a lot faster down there too. Oh heck yeah! We, we never get we never get past twenty five miles an hour on our freeways up here. I, I I thought New York was bad. Forget it. The five, yeah. you know? Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. You, well, I don't I don't get I used to get on the five every day, and 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 yeah, it's uh, these people. Uh, you got to do 85 just to stay from people hitting you in the rear end, in the back. So you know, it, it, and it gets really crowded out there. But 
Yeah, and then Nick Nixon. Well, what what happened to fifty five? You know, he wasn't he a fifty five? He was the one that instilled fifty five miles an hour, I believe, back when the the first gas crisis started to happen. Yeah, well, he created the EPA. He created yeah. the Environmental Protection Agency, which did a lot of good things. But like every other bureaucracy, they've created, they they always keep finding a need of things to fix, and they never go away. <laughs> Become bur bur I couldn't wait for that fifty five mile an hour speed limit to go away. I'm like. Oh, I know. That was, if, if I, there was my father-in-law years ago because uh, they lived down there, and and uh, he said the uh, state patroller got right up behind him, <laughs> put the lights on, the loudspeaker, and said, "Sir," and he thought, "Oh God, I'm, he's gonna pull me." <laughs> he's gonna take his "Sir, speed up." <laughs> he was going about 52 <laughs> miles an hour in the left lane. It's like move it along, get up to 80 with the rest of us. <laughs> Talk about legalism. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, well, I'm going to tell you what we're going to discuss next time. I'll give you a little bit of heads up uh, because uh, I know, Scott, you asked me about uh, trying to have a little more preparation. So we're going to, we're almost finished with this. I think this, uh, this next definitely, definitely finish up this subject. But we're going to be talking about the uh, stock sacrifices. And including the burnt offering, the grain offering, the drink offering, the fellowship offering, the sin offering, and the guilt offering. And we're going to talk about the festivals, the Passover, the Feast of First Fruits, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and uh, Feast of Booths. And then uh, we'll finish up by talking about uh, David uh, and... Um, and then finally, Jonah. Sounds okay. good. Yeah, so uh, not that you really need. Uh, that's what's nice about having you guys uh, with me is that uh, you don't really need uh, a lot of preparatory time. Uh, normally, everything I've done before has always been about uh, just the message of salvation. And... Uh, even though I do a little quick preparation, I'll prepare a little outline and just figure out what verses I want to discuss. It's pretty much extemporaneous. Whereas this subject, uh, because it's all these things that uh, I have a cursory knowledge, but I don't really understand it all enough to teach on it. I had to go and do a lot of preparation. It took me about a week to prepare for this subject. That's why I have like eight, ten pages of notes here. Uh, but uh, you guys... Uh, been very very good at being able right off the top of your head just you know very insightful things to, to contribute. Mitch, did you raise your hand again, or are you just trying to? No, I, I had a fly. I was. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> what do you got? A horse a stable back there? What's the deal? I got uh, chickens back here. I want to get some goats. <laughs> I'll get your goat. I just uh, 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 you know so. But it's amazing where I lived in Carlsbad. There were no flies. I don't know. Uh, you know, my doors open all day when I lived in Carlsbad. We were closer to the ocean, I think. But here, man, I, I'm like it's like Jersey. Flies are everywhere. So, you uh, guys, I want let's keep on talking privately. But I want to end the broadcast, uh, and uh, this is a good stopping point before we go on to the finish it up uh, next week. And so I'm going to close it off. Is there anything final you want to say before I close this down? And then uh, you, the three of us will still be on. Tanya already left, but we'll be on. We can talk uh, privately. No, I think, I think we had a, a pretty good study. I think it, we've been uh, really hitting the idea of grace really hard and, uh, and, 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 and bringing that to light uh, really well uh, through everything that's, that's, that's been done. By the way, I haven't done any study. It wasn't because I haven't wanted to, but I kind of didn't want to study for this. I, I kind of wanted to just do this off the top of my head because I think that if I was studied, I, I, somehow or another, whenever I study, I, I, I just, you know, not that I don't study. It's just that it's just sometimes it, it gets in the way of, of just being free. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fine. But, but this subject also is uh, something uh, more... Uh, right up your alley, anyway. I think I, you've made a lot of videos uh, on Old Testament, uh, the importance of the Old Testament, and every one of your videos is basically the same as this, talking about 
what the Old Testament really means. It's all pointing to Jesus. So this is not new to you. So uh, all right, if uh, uh, what uh, which one of you guys wants to give like a final altar call to anybody who's watching to tell them how to how to get saved? Because some people watching this uh, may not be saved. I want to be saved. Uh, you know what? Anybody who's watching this and who has tried to follow the idea here, um, a lot of people get nervous about the idea. Well, I don't know. Did it take? Am I saved? Am I not saved? I mean, I see all of this, and how much faith do I need? And um, the, the major thing I'd have to say is relax. Understand that what we're telling you is that Christ makes up for your shortcomings. Where you don't think you have enough faith, Christ gives you the faith. All you have to do, and really you don't do it, it's, it, 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 it's by the Holy Spirit. It's by the Holy Spirit speaking through, 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 through believers like us that are giving you a message that God has given you fertile ears to hear. And when you hear this message, it doesn't make you get your back up like, oh no, uh, uh, I have to follow a law and get and, 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 and get down on myself. It's one that releases you and liberates you from legalism, but at the same time helps you live a holy life in Christ. It gives you a legalism that's free, that's given to you as a gift, his love that adopts you as a son and a child. And when you see the revelation of the love of Christ, then you can open up your mouth and say, Dear God, I want what you have to offer me. And when you do that, you're basically on your way. And you can open up your mouth and say a prayer, but really it's a matter of what's revealed in your mind, what you see, and how it affects your heart. Then what comes out of your mouth is, Please, dear God, give me this great water, this gift of your salvation. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe in his sacrifice for me. I believe in you, God, and thank you for your salvation. So if you believe in your heart in such a way, be, be glad, because this is a great thing. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful, brother. Thank you. I don't think I, I've ever, ever heard a statement any better than that. I think I think we all have the sense, especially when we're young, that uh, you know there's got to be something more to you know life, and then you start running out after various things that you find uh, don't really fulfill you, and uh, I can honestly say that if you call upon Christ, even though you can't see Him and you can't see God, and you're it's like but you can see things around you that point to evidence of some sort of intelligence beyond this, and you see a certain love that's exuded from people and. When, and when they're relaxed and they say they have a connection with God. and The connection is Jesus Christ. The chasm between us and God is so great that everything we know about God was initiated by God. There was a time when we were worshiping the planets and the stars and saying they were God until God tapped one man and said, you know, I am one. And it's been a continuing, ongoing revelation. The fulfillment of it was God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, and uh, it survived, and it's been it's been tried to stomp out by the strongest government in the world at that time, and it, it still lives because he lives, and he can hear you. He who made, made the ear does hear, and it's not a formula. You don't have to go through anybody else. Just talk to him. Just ask him for life and believe on him, and you'll be okay. All right? Amen. Amen, guys. Amen. Okay, uh, so... Uh, if anybody who's watching, thank you for watching, and uh, we'll be back again next Sunday to finish up this uh, very important subject, uh, Old Testament pictures and shadows of Jesus' blood atonement. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, whose name is Jesus Christ.